the art of the Northern Renaissance, like the art of the Italian Renaissance, is beautiful and classic and produced by many masters. But you will see in, um, I hope, in this PowerPoint that while it embraces humanism and many of the same characteristics of the art of the Italian Renaissance, uh, perspective, proportion, realism, etc., it emphasizes different things and really has a very different look to it. We're going to look at a couple of artists. The first is a Flemish artist named Jan van Eyck. Flemish people are from Flanders. Flanders is in what was called the Low Countries at this time. Um, think of it as the modern day Netherlands, Belgium region. This is perhaps Jan van Eyck's most famous painting, The Marriage of the Narfellini. Perhaps you have seen it. This is a portrait that was done to commemorate the marriage of Giovanni and Narfellini, an Italian merchant and his wife. Mr. Van Eyck was painting an Italian couple because he studied art in Italy with uh, some of the great Italian masters. I love this painting um, for what it shows. I think it's a very nice painting to look at and you can really see the good perspective in it and some of those uh, characteristics of Italian Renaissance art, but it also contains so many things that are distinctive about the Northern Renaissance as well. Namely, uh, a great attention to detail. And this is something that you will see in Van Eyck's work, a remarkable amount of detail. Look at the light coming in the window, look at the furniture, look at the rug, look at the woman's clothing. Everything has a very fine attention to detail in it. Now. If I ask you what stands out to you about this painting, think about that for a second. Very often I hear the answer, she's pregnant, the woman is pregnant. Perhaps she was. Marriage was contractual and was arranged in the Renaissance time period. And very often upon betrothal, a woman went to live with her husband and pregnancy very much uh, could be a consideration before an official marriage could take place. Um, having children was that important. But whether she is or not, her clothing is rich, it is extravagant, it is abundant, and that is definitely a sign of their wealth. Um, the bed in the picture is a sign of domestic tranquility. There's a lot of really cool symbols in this painting. Notice the little dog down in the front. Fido, fidelity, symbolic of loyalty and fidelity in marriage. The shoes, little Dutch shoes, along with the bed, being symbolic of domestic happiness. In the chandelier, and again, look at the detail in the chandelier, there is one candle that is lit in the chandelier. And this, of course, symbolizes the presence of Christ in the marriage. Now, notice something else. Notice the mirror on the back wall. Here is the reflection painted into that mirror, just like we were looking at it in the room with the couple and the painter in the background. So Jan Van Eyck, while he really represents Northern Renaissance art with his focus on detail and attention to fine detail in his painting, uh, really was quite a master of perspective as well in his work. This is Van Eyck's painting called the Madonna de Cancellier. Uh, again, I show you this to show how well he did perspective and you can see in the archways, but look at the detail in this painting and look at the difference in how Van Eyck treats his Madonna compared to Raphael's Madonna's. Um, namely the crown, very often in the Madonna's, Mary wears the crown um, for being the queen of heaven. Look at the difference in Van Eyck's baby Jesus compared to Raphael's baby Jesus. But again, look at the rich detail in this painting, in the columns, in the floor, in the folds of the dress, of the robe, um, and the robe of the monk. I love this painting too. It's not as pretty as some of the others that we have looked at, but this painting is really remarkable for a couple of reasons that I'll get to in a minute. This is simply a Madonna by Van Eyck. He painted quite a lot of Madonnas as well. Here's the Blessed Mother again with her crown. Uh, like Van Eyck used to be richly detailed. Look at the detail in the church walls. Kind of an interesting looking baby Jesus in this particular Madonna. 
Um, and it kind of shows that Van Eck, you know, his use of proportion maybe isn't quite all of that. But here's where his detail and his realism comes into play. What's remarkable about this painting is the light. Notice the light coming in the church windows, how beautiful and natural it is, how well Van Eck has captured that kind of realism. Um, he certainly was incredibly accomplished with those kinds of fine details. And what's really remarkable about this painting is just how natural the light is, how he captured that light. Albrecht Dürer was a German painter of the Renaissance time period. He was a great humanist. He was definitely in the hermetic fold of Michelangelo and Mirandola and other guys. And Dürer was an accomplished painter and he was, he's best known, however, for his wood carvings of which he made many. Wood carving was an extravagant art form in the Renaissance. It, it still would be. Um, to be a wood carver, one had to start with a block of wood and literally carve the image into the wood, which was then filled with ink and pressed upon paper. Now, uh, just like da Vinci wrote the hundreds of pages in those notebooks backwards and from uh, right to left, um, wood cuttings had to be done in the mirror image as well because you had to flip it over to press it on the painting or to the paper excuse me and so that look at how intricate this painting is how full of detail it is um and you can imagine just how talented and patient he must be durer's work also represents something else about northern renaissance art that makes it different from italian renaissance art and that is its focus on religious or emotional intensity um, Northern art very often will kind of pack this emotional punch. It's a little bit more intense, very fervently religious in, in many cases. And you'll notice this in a lot of these paintings. But here we have the archangels led by Michael who are slaying the demons, killing Satan, expelling him from heaven. And so this has got a certain violence to it. Um, and uh, it's kind of gory if you can look at the devil's faces, but a really remarkable piece of art. This is perhaps Durer's best known woodcut, The Knight. It's the tired, defeated knight returning from the Crusades, a great hero of the Crusades and symbolic of the best of uh, European Christianity. And uh, again, there's a great deal of detail in this paint um, drawing woodcut excuse me notice the little devil in the background the devil has come to tempt the knight but he will remain firm there's another demon back here the knight rides with the protection of the lamb if you even noticed it at all uh, the little lamb the protection of christ christ of course is the lamb lots of rich symbolism and a lot of northern Renaissance art. It kind of looks like a little dog, I know, but it's the lamb and the knight rides with the protection of Christ. So very intricate and beautiful forms of art. Durer actually made a lot of money in his lifetime selling copies of his wood carvings. Um, he was a pioneer as an artist of making money by selling reproductions of his own work, something that really horrified many of the great uh, artistic masters of the time period that Durer eschewed patronage. He didn't seek a rich patron. He simply made numerous copies of his work that were high quality and he sold them to people with the money to buy them. It made each piece of art much less expensive, but it also, in going for volume, uh, made Durer a pioneer in the business of art. And it made him a pretty rich fellow. Uh, this is called the Isenheim Altarpiece. Isenheim is a, a city, excuse me, in the Holy Roman Empire in the modern state of Germany. And I'm showing you this picture uh, by Gruenwald. Not, it's a beautiful and interesting piece of Northern Renaissance art, but to show you the concept of the altarpiece, which were very popular art forms in the Northern Renaissance, in the Northern cities during the Renaissance. 
An altarpiece was very often in the form of a triptych. A triptych meaning there were three parts that you can see, the one in the middle, the one to the left, and the one to the right. This one has a base piece as well. Triptychs could be closed, they could be open, it could be open part way, um, depending upon what you wanted to show. And so the Isenheim altarpiece is a very, uh, I guess, intense, emotional, you've got a little bit of violence in this as well, the crucifixion of Christ, um, and a richly detailed painting. Um, you can see the two men on the sides are probably patrons of the work. Below, Christ is laid in the tomb. In the centerpiece, Christ hangs upon the cross, and it really gives a big sense of his agony, his agony, the pain in which he is. Um, to the right of Christ is uh, Peter and the lamb at the bottom. Do you see the lamb here? Again, a symbol of Christ as a sacrificial lamb the savior look at christ's hands look at his fingers so grew involved very much going into extensive detail to provide a sense of the agony and pain um over on the left hand side of the cross is mary magdalene mary the mother of god and the um, disciple john but uh, Gruenwald's focus on, on detail and the emotional intensity of the painting overtakes his use of perspective and proportion that the Italian masters went for that they really sought perfection in. Because look at how out of proportion these characters are in the painting. So just a different, a different focus uh, from the Italian uh, art to the Northern art. And we'll finish with a painter called Peter Bruegel. Bruegel was another Flemish painter who's from the Netherlands, and I love his work. Bruegel's work often depicts scenes from daily life, and this makes it very different from Renaissance art in and of itself. Um, Renaissance art often painted something or someone. It was a portrait, or it was a depiction of a religious scene, or something else. Bruegel really kind of stands out in a school of uh, northern masters who painted scenes from daily life and nobody did more or did them better than Peter Bruegel did. And this is one of his best known paintings, children's games. And Bruegel liked to paint on big canvases and Bruegel's paintings are very often very busy. They've got a lot of action in them. Um, but because he did scenes from daily life, they're very good resources for kind of understanding what, what community or village life would have been like during this time period the experience of regular people. Bruegel was pretty good at perspective, as you can see from looking at this painting. And you could spend hours checking out all the kids and everything that they did, a very, very fine attention to detail and to many, many details in Bruegel's paintings like this. Here's a detail from the game, the children playing leapfrog. Here you can see them rolling uh, hula hoops. They're having a bit of a chicken fight right here. They're simmering around the rosy. Um, here's our leapfroggers right behind. They're riding a little barrel. They're doing all kinds of things, engaging in all kinds of games, many of which are even um, familiar to us today. This Bruegel painting is called The Massacre of the Innocents, and the theme of this painting, the subject of this painting, is quite political. The title, The Massacre of the Innocents, is drawn from the story in the Gospel in which King Herod orders his soldiers to slay all the little baby boys under the age of two in hopes of killing the Christ child, this king that he has heard about. And, um, and so the story... The basis of the title is biblical, but this is a very political painting, the meaning, the political meaning of which we'll explore in the next unit. This is kind of a gruesome painting. Um, it's not cute like children's games, but I wanted to show this to you because it really demonstrates, again, this fine use of detail that a lot of the realism and real feeling uh, in the art of the Northern Renaissance comes from this attention to detail. Look at the footprints in the snow. Okay, look at the footprints in, 
in the snow, the barren twigs on the trees. A very, very fine attention to detail. And then there is the massacre of the innocents, the small bundled children at the hands of the merciless soldiers. And uh, we'll talk about what prompted this painting again in the next unit, but quite intense and quite violent. Here's a happier Bruegel painting, um, The Peasant's Dance. I love this painting. It gives a great sense of festivity and fun. Um, festivals were very much a part of the common person's village life uh, during the Renaissance time period. Life was hard for regular people. There was lots of work to do just to survive day to day, but also lots of fun to be had. And drinking and dancing and the playing of music, eating food were all part of of the festival, which might celebrate a saint's day or a feast day or some other anniversary of a kind, a wedding, any great celebration like that. And so Bruegel gives us a good sense of the community and the uh, really joyful nature of the occasion. And just like his other paintings, there's so much, there's so much going on. Look at the little couple kissing in the background. But Bruegel here, in, in focusing on other things, you know, he kind of loses his sense of perspective and proportion. Like, look at the size of the woman and the small girl here relative to the table. And just um, so what they excelled at and what make these paintings special uh, vary very drastically from the North to the Italian uh, in, terms of, in terms of the art. And we'll finish up with this Bruegel painting, The Fight Between carnival and lent the experience of the carnival was a great celebration in the european villages it was a time for drinking and all kinds of mayhem and fun as you can see here and this was a communal experience because lent was a communal experience in which everybody made kind of a communal sacrifice it wasn't a private and personal thing like we experience now and so everybody gave up drinking and there were no weddings and there were no burials and couples were supposed to refrain even from marital relations, etc. And so everyone got together and had their fun in the two weeks before. And so Bruegel is showing us here the great, the great struggle. Here's the church over in the corner. It's empty and the people certainly are having a good time in the run up to Lent. There's a couple of details. The guy riding a beer barrel. Look at the things on these people's heads. And then I'll finish with this image. I love it, this always makes me laugh. Here's this poor woman with a beehive on her head. And look at the expression on the face of the child who is looking up at her. So fight between carnival and Lent and Bruegel and his depiction of daily life.